It's time for Good Game Spawn Point. With special guest Pip from News to Me. Coming up on the show, we take an adventure in the afterlife in a review of Flipping Death. Right. Easy. It's pretty much the best ice cream I've ever eaten. Plus, we check out the spooky spelunking of Chasm. And we show you how to make some custom Roblox figures. So has anything changed since the last time I was here? Uh, well, you've seen the new set. Yeah. Barge is in space now. Wait, what? Uh, Darren's gone fully digital. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, and uh, this is Jen. Hi, I'm Jen. Wait, you guys are still a show about video games, right? We, we sure, sure are. are. Flipping Death is a side-scrolling adventure puzzler developed by Zoink Games, which will see you dimension hopping between the land of the living and the dead in order to solve a series of comedic puzzles. In the quiet town of Flatwood Peaks, you play as Penny, a wisecracking teenager who, after an unfortunate accident, finds her spirit stuck in the land of the dead, where restless souls go before they pass on to the afterlife. Hey, welcome to the party! But when Death himself mistakes her for an intern, Penny is forced to don his robes and scythe and take over his duties, while also trying to work out who or what has taken control of her body in the real world. But that's, that's my body, dang it! Who knew being dead involves so much work? We know, right? But don't worry, because there's lots of spoopy spirit fun to be had. Penny can switch between the two worlds by taking control of living beings on the hey. other side and using their bodies to move about. Great. I really like the walking animation once you take control, all wobbly and shaky. It's like someone who's read about walking but has never actually tried it before. You can also get into people's heads and see what they're thinking, which can lead to some pretty funny interactions. What are the secret government flavors? <laughs> yeah, right. Like I'd tell a voice in my head that. Nice try, telepathic ice cream cone. It's also really funny to me that no one seems surprised by what is happening. <laughs> sure, they might be a bit shocked at first, but then their body is moving about on its own and they're all like, oh well, typical Tuesday. Oh, hold on. It's quite silly, but that's the fun of it. We wouldn't want to think we were actually hurting them after all. When you're not inhabiting someone, you'll be moving around the land of the dead, helping your fellow spirits complete their unfinished business. This can range from reuniting a chainsaw-loving mermaid with her long-lost love to solving the mystery of an elderly lady's untimely demise. I remember getting married and then, bam, Corpse City. The main story is broken up into self-contained chapters and the quests are often linked. This means that to solve the first one on your list, you may need to solve others for the solution to become clear. And they can be quite tricky. Hello, hello! Oh, Pip, as always, you are correct. But there's so much fun to be had as you watch the pieces fall into place, solving one problem with another. Uh, for instance, in order to get a woman out of her coma, you have to get her to her motorcycle. But to do that, you need to get her out of the hospital, which you can't do unless you break the window to her room. To do that, you have to replace yes. the weak arm of a tennis player with a stronger one, so that he's strong enough to hit a bowling ball, and then... All right, OK, Darren, I think we get the idea. And it is pretty ridiculous. But it does encourage creative thinking. The answer might not always be obvious, but this kind of interconnected problem solving is just the kind of thing that gets my CPU all fired up. <laughs> you might want to get that looked at, Darren. <laughs> uh, please, not in front of Pip, Jem. <laughs> OK, I can understand wanting a challenge, but some of the solutions are really left field, which can make them really funny, but also very frustrating to try and figure out. I'll admit, I even had to look up a guide a few times because I was stuck. Hey, there's no shame in asking for help. You know, I got stuck a bunch as well. There is a hint section with picture clues of what to do, which can be helpful if you're already on the right path and just aren't sure of how to put the pieces together. Often, though, I just end up stumbling my way through quests, trying to trigger an event, but that's not nearly as satisfying as working it out for yourself. There is a lot of aimless wandering for sure, especially at the beginning of each chapter, when both world maps add new areas to explore, and with it, enemies to avoid and more people to control. Thankfully, though, because Penny can't be physically hurt, outside of losing some of the souls you collect, you're free to explore with little fear of consequences. Which is fantastic, because you'll want to explore every nook and cranny flipping death has to offer. How good are the environments? I mean, they're so quirky. From the chipper, happy-go-lucky, sun-dabbled streets of Flatwood Peaks to the haunting, shadow-infested underbelly that is the land of the dead, everything has this really unique cartoony look to it. And that 2.5D style really brings in an element of otherworldly strangeness too. Although the characters do a pretty good job of embodying strangeness. What? Huh? 
They are terrifying. Yeah, no kidding. Also, the way that the tops of their heads just sort of float above their lower jaws. I mean, ugh, creepy. Combined with the way they move, all twitchy and jagged, even without Penny controlling them, it can lead to some pretty weird imagery. Oh, out of the way, everyone. I'm on official spiritual business. All right, let's wrap this up. Final thoughts? Overall, I think Flipping Death is a really funny, creative, and enjoyable experience. Its comedic writing and storytelling kept me invested, even when the puzzle sometimes made me want to quit. I think it could do with some polish, but ultimately, I had a good time. I'm giving it four out of five rubber chickens. All right, despite its uh, odd visuals, I really dug how much personality they crammed into every character I met. However, I did feel like I needed a bit more direction in the puzzle department. So, it's a three and a half from me. It's time to walk around and do bubblegum And I've got plenty of bubblegum All right, time for a fresh stack Bunch? A bucket? Of gaming news scoops Wait, what is the collective noun for a group of scoops? Doesn't matter, the point is, it's time for the scoop First up, a film adaptation of mobile puzzle game Monument Valley has been announced Oscar winning director Patrick Osborne is set to direct the film Which will be made by Paramount Pictures the plan is to blend live action and animation, perhaps further exploring Princess Ida's search for forgiveness, which is the game's central mysterious journey. Or maybe just further twisting our brains into pretzels with the world's dynamic architecture. Speaking of video game adaptations, the arcade classic Galaga is set to be turned into a television series. News of the project first emerged last year, but with an executive producer now on board, it's looking more likely. Taking the form of a 12-part animated series called Galaga Chronicles, many are wondering just how a game like this might work as a fully-fledged show. Some of those alien insects must have intriguing backstories, right? Moving on, and the Pokemon World Championships took place last week in Nashville, Tennessee. While Ozzy Alfredo Gonzalez Chang was among the competitors, the trainers who eventually emerged as the very best in their divisions included Won Lee and James Evans. Of course, given that the event was held in Nashville, the event took on the theme that was a little bit country, with a country music themed Pikachu and song for the event. Yeah! In other gaming news, more Nindies! After an indie highlights presentation made not long ago, Nintendo followed up with part two of their announcement. Into the Breach, Towerfall, complete with playable Celeste characters, and Minico's Night Market are some of the indie titles coming out for Switch this year, with others like Untitled Goose Game coming next year. <coughs> Can't wait to have a gander at that one. I'm sure Goose feels the same. And now the extra scoop. <coughs> this week, a platforming rat? Science Channel The Q showed off a Super Mario Bros themed rat maze, complete with warp pipes and question blocks. Of course, the rat, whose name is Shelly, didn't quite traverse the setting with as much finesse as Mario, but still earned herself a treat. And if you found something with a certain essence of extra scoop, let us know here. Maybe it's a galaxy of scoops, a, a crew of scoops, a field, of, a school, a club, a scoop of scoops. I don't know, I give up. <laughs> Jam and welcome to our very own GGSP Crafternoon. I'm challenged by the elusive Sunita. GGSP's production coordinator, ruler of craft, sultan of scissors, corporal of cardboard, to make cool and colourful figurines from your favourite video games. Today our crafty challenge is... to make these super cool Roblox style paper figurines. How awesome is that? So I've been given these super easy to follow instructions for... Goose, Red, and little me. But we also have these really cool custom templates for you to create your own characters. Complete with various facial expressions, hairstyles and skin tones, so you can mix and match to your liking. To get started, you'll first need a few things from the handy dandy craftsnal. Get it? It's like arsenal, but for crafting! Ugh. This challenge is fairly simple and most of the things we use you'll already have at home. But for this, you will need paper or card, Pencils, pens or crayons, scissors, glue, paddle sticks, plus any fancy bits and bobs to give your figure some flair. But most importantly, you will need a standard factory setting, fresh out of the box, adult. Wouldn't you need help cutting those little tricky bits? Why haven't you cleaned your room yet? Uh, uh, Are you crafting around? If you get lost, you can visit our website here to download the handy checklist for this episode as well as any other Crafternoons we have coming up. Step one, cutting out the shapes. How about we start with little mini-me? Start with separating all the pieces into segments. Then carefully cut along and around each outline. 
Next, section the tabs. After, group them into legs, arms, torso, hair and head so they don't get lost. Uh, uh, Sunita, I'm missing an arm. Oh, thank you. Ha ha. Step two, time to glue. So glue is a little sticky, no pun intended. So to avoid sticking hands to faces and faces to desks, Sunita! <laughs> grab a wooden paddle stick. Before you glue, fold all the edges and tabs down, but leave the head and hair till later. Grab the torso, apply a small layer of glue to the largest tab and connect it to the front. Then apply glue to the smaller tabs and connect them too. Repeat these steps with your arms and legs. Step three, the head and the hair. Now, the head and the hair are a little bit more tricky because they have all these small corners and curves. So, I think it's time we call in the grown up. But only if you need help, you'll probably be fine. It's better to cut in small sections so there's less room for error. You can always cut more, but you can't cut less. Measure it around the head to check. Because if it's too tight, it won't fit around the noggin. Next, glue your folded tabs to connect the base. And finally, attach your head to the torso. And because this is my corner, I have interchangeable hair colours. You know, when real me gets bored of purple. Step four, body building. We've marked the template with a dot where you need to glue each part to the torso, like so. Then wait for each piece to dry thoroughly before moving on to the next one. Otherwise, there'll be dire consequences. And be careful not to over glue because it'll make the paper all wet and gross and sad looking. Remember, it doesn't have to be perfect, as long as you're having fun with it. Step five, go wild! Use the blank templates to colour and create figurines of yourself, your friends or your family. Here's one I created of Sunita. You can also resize them to create miniatures, oversized ones or even titans. And that's our own Roblox-inspired paper craft figurines. If you spawnlings, or should I say craftlings, make your own figurines, why don't you send a photo to our email? Or send in your ideas for a crafty challenge. Then watch me attempt to create it one craft afternoon. Okay, Pip, welcome back to the Ask SP desk. Now, it has been a while since you were here last, so maybe we should do a bit of a refresher. Ah, uh, not necessary, Goose. I know what to do. The aim is to win the Noob Cup, right? Oh, no! No, in fact, we want to avoid the Noob Cup at all costs. Oh, well, simple mistake. All right, let's ask some questions then, shall we? No, Pip, we answer the questions that the Spawnlings send in to us. Oh, it's all coming back to me now, of course! But never fear, you guys. I brought my answer pants along, so we have nothing to worry about. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started. And first up, we have a video question from Mittens the Cat. Yeah, it's, it's over here. Oh, right, of course. Hey, GDSP, I have three questions for you. One, from Splatoon 2, what do the stars next to their level number mean? Two, would there be an eSports 2019? Because my owner wants to enter. And three, what levels are you and what weapons do you use on Splatoon 2? Goodbye. Well, thanks, Mittens. GGSP must be quite big in the feline community. Well, Pip, we're uh, actually quite poor pillar with cats. Uh, I think it's actually pronounced um, popular. No, no, it's a pun. You know, poor cats. And anyway, uh, in answer to your question of what a star next to the level number means in Splatoon 2, well, as of an update from late last year, once a player has reached the maximum level of 99, they can talk to Judd to reset their level display to 1, but with an added special star next to it. They can then work their way back up again. This is known as a prestige system. Ooh, sounds prestigious. Or should I say, poor stigious. <laughs> per Perstigious. Mm, yeah. yeah, now you're getting it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now to the question of whether there will be Splatoon eSports in 2019. If you mean the Splatoon Championships, I think it's highly possible there will be another one next year. Yeah, I agree. The European Championships have already been confirmed. As for the Australia New Zealand comp, while details haven't been announced yet, if it's the same as this year, I'd guess registrations will probably be open around March-ish 2019-ish. 
But Mittens, if your owner is keen to splattle it out, best to check with the grown-ups about things like age restrictions and the terms and conditions of entering. I hear 17 might be the minimum age of entry. Yeah, you might be right there, Pip. Now, to what levels we are and what weapons we use in Splatoon 2. Well, you know, I'm actually kind of secretive about my Splatoon level. There are some things I'd prefer not to divulge. I'm a bit of a riddle like that, <laughs> wrapped in an enigma like some kind of cool spy guy. Ah, how mysterious, or should I say nubious? OK, what about your preferred weapon? Then? Oh, well, that I can divulge. I quite like the use of the tried and tested Splattershot Junior. Occasionally, when I'm feeling bold, I might splash out with the Splat Julie. Nice choices there. All right, how's about another question, Goosington? Goosington? Well, actually, maybe that can be my spy guy name. <laughs> Makes me sound distinguished. Oh. But anyway, our next question is from KO Girl from Stardew Valley Court. Hi, GGSP. We here at the court are very mad because Stardew Valley said multiplayer was coming on August the 1. But it has not come on PS4. Why is that? Also, what's your fave NPC in Stardew Valley? PS, you are awesome. Oh. Thanks for your question, KO Girl. OK, in answer to your question about why Stardew Valley multiplayer hasn't come out on PS4 yet, you're right that it was released on August 1st for PC. But as far as we know, multiplayer is still coming soon for PS4, Switch and Xbox One. Yes, the game's developer, Concerned Ape, is just one lone dev doing it more or less by himself. And sometimes it takes a bit more time to make sure console versions of things are working properly. So we'll have to keep our eyes like bananas peeled for further news on that. As as for our favourite NPCs in Stardew Valley, well, I have to say I have a bit of a soft spot for Linus. He may be scruffy and sometimes loiters around the bins, but he's always friendly and he helped me out the one time that I overdid it in the mines. How about you, Goose? Uh, well, personally, I've always been a fan of Robin and Demetrius. Where would you be without Robin's helpful carpentry shop? And I love how Demetrius is always investigating the science of the town. You know, they really are a dynamic duo. Now, I reckon we have time for about one more quick question. This one is from Akex. Is Slime Rancher out on PS4? Question mark. Thanks! Exclamation mark. Eee! Ha <laughs> ha! Thanks, Akex. Uh, maybe we should double check with Darren regarding this one. Yes! I love calling Darren. OK, may I? Oh, please go right ahead, Pip. Yes! Hello, Darren here. Dazza, mate. It's Pip. How are you going? Oh, uh, hello, Pip. I've uh, uh, just been running some uh, system diagnostics which have revealed that I'm uh, performing optimally. So it's going well. Super cool, you could say. <laughs> That's great, Daz, man. All right, we have a question here about whether Slime Rancher is out on PS4. Now, I thought it was only on PC and Xbox One. So, care to give your two cents or two bits? Bites? I don't know, whatever unit you prefer. Affirmative! Slime Rancher, which was originally released for PC, Mac, Linux and Xbox One in 2017, has in fact just been released for PS4 as a digital download, with a boxed retail release coming in early September. Woo. Oh cool, thanks for clarifying, Dazza. <laughs> You're most welcome, Pip. Uh, you know, I was wondering if you've got any time to chat about my ideas for an appearance on News To Me. I, I really like to appear on your show. The line's really bad. Uh, I'll have to call you back. Uh, <laughs> ooh, quick thinking there, Pip. And on that close call, I think we're out of time for today. But thank you for your help. You did great. Ah, oh, you're very welcome, Goosington. Hey, could I maybe do the website swishy thing, please? Yeah, go right ahead. Yes! OK, if you have a question for Ask SP, why not swish it here? And make a video question for your chance of getting a cool GGSP pin. Yeah, OK, I think that's enough excitement for one day. Ah, I don't think I've had enough excitement. I think I need to swish a little bit more. How about this? No. And take this! Pip. And one here! Ah. And yeah! Just oh! Wait, it's not doing it. I think I broke it. Hang on. Can I have this, please? Sure. Chasm is the latest title to get on board the nostalgia train with its retro-inspired pixel graphics while simultaneously getting on the current bandwagon of dungeon crawlers full of beasties and backtracking. Well, Goose, it's actually also on the hype train after its developers, BitKid Inc, successfully kickstarted the game five years ago. So, expectations are high. Chasm is an old-school inspired side-scrolling platformer that tells the tale of a newly adorned knight who is sent on a mission to a nearby mining town where the residents have mysteriously disappeared after digging a little too deep, unearthing all manner of vile creatures. Once you arrive at the abandoned town and gain access to the mine, you set off to explore its maze-like tunnels, freeing townsfolk, bashing up beasties, all the while uncovering clues to the mystery of the ancient civilization that now lies beneath. 
It's not the most original storyline, but it does quickly get you where you need to go, which in this case is down. Yeah, I mean, look, I can't say I was that interested in the generic fantasy plotline here. Especially as so much of it is just written up in diary entries or explained to you through long-winded dialogue. I much prefer to explore on my own, wandering aimlessly through the tunnels, something Chasm excels at through its use of procedurally generated map design. I'm not exactly sure how they did this though. Something to do with seeds? Wait, can you grow a map from seeds? Is that a thing? When did this become a thing? Ah, Pip, you're not far off there. A chasm uses a randomised string of numbers known as a seed to generate its level layout, piecing together pre-designed screens so that the map feels less designed and more natural. It's a similar process to that used in Minecraft, where whole worlds are generated and subsequently barcoded with a particular set of numbers and letters. <laughs> so many seeds, so many permutations. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. That is such a complex theory. It sure is. Although, I can't say I really noticed it in this game. <gasps> Screens were just often repeated in my particular playthrough, and many of them just felt like straight corridors with different mixes of monsters. Then again, it is interesting to see it combined with a Metroidvania-style game. Oh, 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 I know this term. Okay, it's basically when a game doesn't allow you access to an area until you have a certain item or ability before backtracking there, using it, and then progressing forward. Yeah, spot on, Pip. Yes. It's made famous by combining the titles of Metroid and Castlevania, the two games that pretty much invented the concept. And Chasm is definitely a Metroidvania, with emphasis on the Vania. That medieval setting, a huge array of fantasy weapons, spells and power-ups, plus those crucial items and abilities that open up new areas of the map. The whole thing is just one giant love letter to that castle-crashing NES game from the 1980s. It's a real shame, then, that it doesn't play as well as its influences. For starters, there's a real blandness to the environments, helped in no way with a dull soundtrack and generic main character. Although, I really did enjoy the creative creature design and all their different attack patterns. But they only highlight the out-of-date controls, which leave you stuck to the ground after swinging your weapon. It just feels clunky, especially after I discovered a workaround by jump attacking instead. Yeah, I did the exact same thing. It all just felt a bit underdeveloped, especially that save system. Sure, having to find a specific save point does add to that old school difficulty, but they did seem unfairly far apart. And sending me back to the main menu after being defeated is just asking for a rage quit. Also, how's this? After beating that first tough boss, I proceeded deep into the new zone before eventually dying, only then to realise that my last save was before that boss. What game doesn't put a save point straight after a boss fight? I mean, come on, how many times must I defeat this infernal creature? Why don't you just backtrack after the fight and then use the save before the boss room? That's actually a really good idea, Pip. But that's not the point! <laughs> You do eventually open up shortcuts that can lead you back to town to purchase items from freed townsfolk. And once you grind your way to a decent level, the combat becomes far more forgiving. But it is a long slog to get there, and I can't say I felt the urge to delve any deeper after playing for four or five hours. Yeah, I totally agree. And as much as I usually love this old school kind of gaming, there's nothing here that really sets Chasm apart from other better games in the genre, like the quirky SteamWorld Dig, or the super moody and stunningly crafted Hollow Knight. Personally, I'd say you're better off spending your time in those worlds than this hole in the ground. I'm giving Chasm one out of five rubber chickens. Yeah, I can definitely see the love and respect from all the old games that have come before it, but after being in development for five years, I mean, I was expecting something a little bit more entertaining. So, for that reason, I'm going to give it two out of five rubber chickens. I mean, when you think about it, it's more of a metroidvania. Oh, shady! <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on the show today, guys. You are so welcome, Pip. Absolutely. Sorry again about Darren. He gets nervous when you're around. Next week on the show, we go toe to toe in the Smash Bros. Lookalike Brawl Out. And we review Teen Titans Go Figure. Oh, how I miss the Teen Titans. Plus, we slice to the beat in a let's play of Beat Saber. Don't forget, you can catch news to me at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Oh, and you can also catch heaps more of Good Games Spawn Point online. You're welcome back anytime, Pip. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Goose out. Pip out. Jam out. Mm -hmm.